got to die right now and then he'll go up to heaven But he got here late for the spy meeting And now he's run out of time There's no time to die James Bond, what are you doing trotting around the globe? Fucking lots of women and drinking lots of martinis And telling everyone your name I'm surprised you haven't died countless times already Why do you want to die? It's no time to die Dying is on Tuesdays You've come here on Wednesday You're 24 hours late I'm sure that it would be great If you were here On time But you're not And there's no time to die James Bond 007. Hey, Salmon Skins, that's right. I wrote and had the theme song for the new James Bond movie rejected. And I can officially release it now. That was it there. Now, first off, the producer said, look, we already decided on Billie Eilish for the song. We don't know who you are. Please stop sending us these unsolicited emails they're not as bad as unsolicited dick pics but they're pretty annoying also the song that you've recorded is just a minute and seven seconds the title sequence is a little bit longer than that it's about three to five minutes depending on the song and how many people are involved in making the Bond films also you've clearly just taken your own riff from your podcast and sung vague lyrics about James Bond over it. But uh, I stand by it. I think it's a great song. I think they were silly to uh, not use it. It's just another ball-dropping clangor from the Bond producers, from the Bond people. Don't trust the Bond people. They never get it right. Like when they dropped Radiohead's version of Spectre, which you can listen to uh, online. You can listen to it on Spotify. Someone put it up with a video. I think I've mentioned this before, but it's a fantastic song. Now, I didn't talk about Radiohead releasing. Wait, come back. Just Okay, just two minutes of Radiohead talk. Radiohead's album Kid A and Amnesiac are 20 years old which makes me feel old, but then again, I am. So I was, what, 24 when I saw Radiohead playing on their Kid A tour in a big tent in Punchestown Racecourse, but there wasn't a horse in sight. And it was fantastic, wonderful times. I bought a knockoff bootleg poster off a vendor outside, completely going against All of the ethos of that tour, which was eco-friendly, non-corporate, cool boys playing the tunes. And I was like, yeah, give me that poster. That's completely not endorsed by Radiohead. And it's probably, it's not even printed on paper. It's probably printed on uh, orphans that have been shredded and pulped and cold-pressed into a poster. But I didn't care. Uh, I hung it up for a while, and then I left it hanging in the back of the wardrobe uh, until I revealed all in a video special episode of this podcast that you can only see on my Patreon page. Hey, why not head over to my Patreon page? And for a fiver a month, you get extra episodes usually an extra episode a week. Now, I haven't gotten around to doing this week's extra episode because I'm only getting around to doing the normal episode right now. But I'll put up uh, an extra little episode where I'll go in-depth about what's been happening in my life. This podcast is a stream of consciousness. I don't really prepare it. And I don't really go into too much detail about my life. It's more, this is more of a sort of a funny, shallow, fast-moving brook that just sort of 
playfully splashes around my ankles as I stand in the river that is my life. Whereas sometimes the Patreon can get sort of deep and serious, like a still lake, and you're wading in. I wade in right up to my chest, and it's kind of cold and striking, and it brings out truths in me. Um, so that's the, the lake that is my life, that is my deep subconscious, whereas the little babbling brook is just my river. Uh, my life river just keeps on going, never stops, unless you throw a couple of stones down there. What are the stones? The stones are things like anxiety, guys, like troubles, worries. <laughs> this is like turning into a Brezzy podcast now. I've never listened to Brezzy's podcast. If you don't know Brezzy, he's a handsome, sad man who talks about mental health and profits from it quite extensively. Um, I've never met him. Have I met him? No, I didn't meet him, but I was at a gig one time where he was playing with his band, The Blizzards, who were doing a James Bond. It was a James Bond theme night. Hey, it all it's all cyclical, guys. Now, he didn't do his version of James Bond theme tunes, but they were doing a couple of old classic Bond theme tunes, and people were encouraged to wear tuxedos and cocktail dresses and whatnot but of course this is like 20 year old students who don't have access to any of those things but Brezzy was there singing his songs and this was before he became a sort of a mental health advocate maybe I'm being disingenuous to Brezzy but I mean fuck it I don't care this is my podcast I can say whatever the fuck I want and that is the beauty of of this art form it's also the horror of this art form if you want to call it an art form i just have it's a sort of an extension of social media i guess and you know talking about the patreon episodes being more personal certainly that's a thing that is you know you can so you can take it or leave it but i think my thinking on it, I'm wobbling my table, I'm putting my feet up, I'm wobbling my table as I speak, I'm so sorry. If you are someone who is triggered by table wobbling, then that will absolutely anger you to your core. But how much do I share? If you're listening to this podcast and you really enjoy this podcast, I have been doing this podcast for two years now. This is actually the 100th episode. It's not the, it's the 90th episode overall, but I've done 10 sort of special episodes on movies and whatnot, but this is the 90th episode, Um, so there's like 100 episodes in total, there's 99 episodes of me talking nonsense, and I get kind of uh, not worried that I'm becoming repetitive, but I mean, I am, which is why I'm going to change it up in 10 episodes and make the podcast a little bit uh, different. And this kind of free-form improv sort of silliness, I will probably do that on on the Patreon. But I'm thinking if you do like the silliness and whatever, and you enjoy me, and you enjoy my voice and my thoughts, and my very, very lukewarm, like a bowl of porridge that's been there since the morning, and now it's four o'clock, but it's got cinnamon in it, and it's cold. So cold cinnamon porridge is what I'm comparing my takes to. I could just say they're not hot at all. They're not hot takes. But, you know, if you want to get uh, in depth, if you want to hear me talk about serious things as well, then maybe you'd enjoy that. I mean, for me, it's like one of my favorite podcasts is let's talk podcast recommendations. I think I've recommended Adam Buxton's podcast before. Adam Buxton, who to me is like the podcast interviewer, equivalent of Graham Norton. He is funny, uh, intelligent, and uh, empathetic. You know, he has this thing where he's, he tells people, um, you know, if if I ask you, sometimes he says it from, from the outset, depending on who he's interviewing, and, you know, what their background is, what their story is. There could be some things that come up that they might not want to talk about, be it 
um, you know, grief or uh, some kind of trauma that they've been through, uh, true, and true da, <laughs> and uh, you know, he kind of flags that and says, "You can tell me to shut up or fuck off or whatever," and that kind of puts people at ease. I think, oh, as I stretch and ease myself, and then they just kind of open up to him. But he's just he's very funny, and it's for me, it's just kind of nice hanging around with him in my ears. You know, it's that familiarity that we have with podcasters and with media and it's a real soothing balm we certainly all found that in uh during the first lockdown and i was doing some lockdown material last night actually which is why i'm a little bit hungover i was doing a gig in the liberty hall theater which is a fantastic theater um i'm thinking about putting on a gig there i don't know if i could sell it I might have to go around in a car with uh, a megaphone on top of it, like the Blues Brothers, to try to get people to come, get a bunch of orphans to uh, paste pick posters and pictures and pick posters and post pictures all around town and fill, fill that hall. But a lovely room. But I was talking about uh, the beginning of lockdown when Leo came on and uh, told everyone I've watched Mean Girls and I've watched Lord of the Rings and here's what I've learned from it and that you know that got a laugh it was one of those gigs where you could do little silly things where people would actually laugh a good section of people would laugh and then everyone would laugh at the next bit and whatever but I was trawling through my old podcast episodes because if you if you go back if this is your first episode. Hello, thanks for joining me and having me in your ears. It's a pleasure and an honor to be inside your ears. Ooh, look at this. You keep it very clean. There's very little wax and not, God, I can't even see a blackhead. And I've got my torch out and everything. But um, here, let me give your, your drum a little bit of a massage. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. in your ears, feeling good. Here we go. Ooh, ah. Ooh, uh, I do fly past. Ooh, uh. So, um, what was I talking about? See, this is the problem with being hungover and doing a stream of consciousness podcast that you don't prepare for. You can't remember what you're talking about. Gigs, that's what I was talking about. I was trawling through my old episodes because when I started this, episode one was all about my time on first dates, which was the last time I was on television. Now, I will be on... Christmas Day on a RTE show called Homeschool Hub playing a counterfeit Santa Claus. What is a counterfeit Santa Claus? Uh, someone who's not not a real Santa and made entirely out of corned beef. No, an imposter Santa Claus. But um, yeah, I, I should have done my Santa material. I was actually going to dress like Santa Claus and do the entire gig as Santa, which uh, I thought would be funny. I was trying to think of things to do with Santa that would be funny. And uh, at one point, I was thinking about talking to one of the producers, doing the sketch, uh, which I did with one of the Moon Tours, which is Irish for teacher, Ray, who was very funny and very quick and we had we had lovely little kind of improv moments in it where we went a little bit crazy with the script and I realized I had written in the script that I was eating mince pies so he opens the the pantry door and I'm standing in there dressed as Santa Claus but with my beard uh, which is mostly gray but also has like black hairs and red hairs and like hairs that are not so much red but they look like very very thin copper wiring um so a very like a, a, an absolute smorgasbord of color in my beard a, a cacophony of color a rainbow of color if all of the colors of the rainbow were just gray black red and brown and copper and uh, I didn't have it dyed, obviously, 
and I was wearing the fake glasses, the golden glasses. And the minute I put them on, I just looked like my dad and went, oh, my God, yeah. No paternity tests needed. Just glasses on. I'm like, there you are. How are you, Jerry? Um, and how are you, Jerry? He's probably listening to this podcast. He stopped emailing me uh, his thoughts on the podcast. Um, and I stopped reading them because uh, I don't I don't have them to read. But um, I wrote into the script that I was eating mince pies. And the whole idea of the script was I was an imposter who was just pretending to be Santa Claus because people treated him like Brendan Gleeson gets treated all year round. And also he gets to eat all the leftover food. And uh, I realized I got maybe I should have written uh, cans of Guinness into the script. He's just uh, looking for a can of Guinness. And then like I skull a can of Guinness and uh, at the end, and maybe I keep like fucking it up. So I have to do it like six or seven times. But I'm glad I didn't because then I would have been uh, hung over two days in a row. Um, but this is nice. I'm definitely my head feels lighter, clearer. I think we could do some improv rapping before we have a little break. What do you think, guys? Hey, you can't answer me. You're just listening. I'm gonna just assume you all said yes. Ooh, 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 yeah. Come on, it's 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 Christmas time. Mince pies. There's no meat in them. What a surprise! It's spice fruit. That's the truth. I didn't know that when I was a child. I thought it was minced meat, you see. Minced, not mince. And of course, it was brown because the spice on the fruit made it look like minced meat. And I was thinking, why would people have meat inside a flaky pie? I don't want that. Oh, I'd rather die. Guys, welcome back to the podcast episode that you're listening to. Those ads were funny, weren't they? Merry Christmas, everyone. I don't know if there's probably some kind of Christmas ad in there. I don't know how you guys feel about Christmas. All I know is I am getting some much needed employment as Santa Claus. I mean, back in the beginnings of lockdown, two years ago, nearly at this stage. God, have we been in this fucking thing that long? I guess we have. But kids in the Liberties were saying, Hey, Santa, look at there. That's Santa there. Ha <laughs> ha, Santa. In a way that made me sad, not because I was being taunted uh, by children, which is kind of enough to make your average person sad, but I felt sad that they had lost their innocence because they were obviously saying it in a way that was taunting and also made me believe that they had stopped believing in Santa Claus. Now, when did you stop believing in Santa Claus? Uh, text in with your answers to Edwin Salmon of Knowledge, 087. No, I'm not going to give you my number. Um, tweet at me uh, or something. Or don't, because I find all of that shit annoying. But we'll get to that now in a minute. Uh, God, we're getting into real bad humbug territory. Look, I have made my feelings uh, clear on the Late Late Toy Show. If you want to check out uh, the episode that I did called uh, Jury Duty Santa Claus on the Late Late Toy Show. I think it's like episode 50-something. Check it out. Uh, I could talk about my first and only viewing party, adult viewing party, no children in sight, um, for the Little Late Toy Show, which made me not want to watch it ever again. There is a thing with people who are old enough to know better watching the... Like, if you're a child, you will like the Little Late Toy Show. You may even love the Late Late Toy Show. Cara was telling me about when she was a kid and she would watch it with her brothers in the bed with their mum, eating sweets. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, that's nice. But adults watching it are just being cynical fucks and making cocaine jokes and laughing at children and laughing at the cringiness of it and the occasional heartwarming 
a thing where, you know, some poor unfortunate child for whatever reason uh, is surprised by a pop star or whatever the fucking formula is. It's basically the same thing. It's kind of, they always, because it's the Late Late Show, they have to slip in some kind of depressing sob story, sad sob story, because that's their sort of modus operandi. And uh, something tragic has got to happen to me. I mean, I've already had cancer and survived it, so if I didn't get on the Late Late Show with that, I'm definitely not going to get on with, I don't know, my dodgy knee. My left knee that sounds like a bunch of small twigs being uh, snapped whenever I um, get up off the floor. Get up off of that floor and cripple you to the chair now. Um, one of James Brown's lesser known songs there because it's it's missing some prepositions. Look, as I explained before, I'm hungover. Tis the season. Um it's actually fun doing stand-up gigs when you're hungover because you care less, which makes you relax more, and then you'll actually say funny things. It's like I can be drunk doing a gig, and I was a little bit drunk doing the gig last night, but that kind of helps me. Uh, obviously, drunk not drunk to the point of slurring my words because that's just being bad at your job if your job is to say words uh, in a way in which elicits laughter. But if you're up there going, so guys, this is very complicated as a setup. And I just want you to listen to how it's set up and what I'm talking about. Because if you don't know how to set up, then there's a joke at the end. Is that going to be a punchline? Who knows? And that's irresponsible as a comedian. But the Late Late Toy Show was on last night, and I didn't watch it. Like I said, it was doing this this gig, but it, it is kind of crazy. There was uh, another comedian there who was on in the Laughter Lounge, which is the big, big room for comedy in the city center. And there was, I don't know, I think the capacity is 300 or something. Um, I don't, it's probably a little bit reduced because of COVID, but it is uh, having an effect. The Late Late Toy Show has an effect. There was only about 90 people in there. People are maybe staying at home because of COVID. And I think there was people at this gig last night who uh, didn't show up. I know for a fact some people who told me that they weren't going either because they were afraid of COVID or they were afraid uh, of laughing too much. And... Or they just wanted to watch the Late Late Toy Show. Those are the three reasons. But everyone everyone who showed up was lovely. Uh, it was great fun. And I got drunk for free. And we uh, saved lives. So, you know, I love the way I put that bit last. Like it was the least important thing. I mean, selfishly... Selfishly? selfishly, selfishly it was... The, I'm really having trouble with multi-syllabled words. That's, that's become clear to me now, because um, that's not the first time I've done this in uh, this episode, so I apologize. But yeah, um, as long as I get drunk, I don't care who gets saved. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> that's an awful thing to say. But uh, no, I'll always do stuff for charity I have done before. Uh, it's it's important it's important to give back. I just won't talk about it at length on a podcast because I'm so fucking humble. Uh, it's unbelievable. Now I wrote a few things down. So like, I, maybe you've switched off at this point because I've been bad mouthing the late late toy show, but um, like, I don't care. I've kind of, I mean. I've been thinking about it because obviously I have a six month old boy who's not fully aware of uh, anything right now. I mean, that's a pretty obvious statement to say. He's not fully aware. I'm not one of those parents like, oh, no, he knows everything. He's well aware. He's get, He gets the broadsheets. And uh, even though he's only a six month old baby, he can sit and he can hold the whole thing out in front of him. That's the thing with the broadsheets. Someone someone told me uh, years ago, it's like, oh, I don't read the broadsheets because the papers are too big. It's much easier 
to read the sun. And I was like, well, yeah, in a sort of a practical holding newspaper kind of way, but in a less practical, you don't get really any news, just tits and gossip and some sport. If that's what you want, then fair enough. But Luke doesn't know anything about Santa Claus, about Christmas, and I'm a little bit torn on the on the whole thing. You know, we don't um we haven't had that discussion, but who am I to bow humbug his Christmas away? I was doing research before for jokes about Christmas. I do a bit about Santa Claus, which I don't think is on any of my YouTube clips that I've put up. Or maybe it is, but if you haven't heard it, it's basically I talk about Santa Claus and I say I have a difficult relationship with Santa Claus because when I was a child, I don't know if you're familiar with that song, I saw uh, Santa kissing, or I saw Mommy kissing Santa Claus underneath the mistletoe. I saw Mommy kissing Santa Claus underneath the mistletoe one night. And I got a fright, but it's a, it's an old 50s song. And I said, that song was actually written about uh, me, which t- kind of makes no sense because uh, I was born in 1977. So the 50s were long gone by that stage. But I say it anyway. I say that song was written about me because uh, there was one Christmas Eve where I was in, in my bed and uh, I heard some some yuletide rumblings downstairs. Some tinsel was being was being ruffled in an unfamiliar fashion. And I listened with my very good ears and thought, hmm, I must, I must investigate. So uh, I put on my Victorian night schmuck and I got my candle and my candle holder and I put my nightcap on because even then I was bald. And I crept out onto the onto the landing, and the wind was blowing, and the the trees were swaying, and the branches were clattering up against the glass, and snow was driving against the window, and you could barely see two inches in front of your face outside. It was very atmospheric and Christmassy in snow time. Snow times galore. And I crept out and I looked down and there was my father dressed as Santa Claus and uh, getting getting it on with my mum up again the Christmas tree. And I gasped <gasps> like that, I made that noise. And I ran back into my room and I uh, put out my candle with my candle snuffer. And I got back into my four poster bed and my manservant, uh, Stanley, asked me, everything all right, sir? And I said, uh, yes, yes, that I am fine. I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, tired. I'm going to go to sleep now. You, you, you're relieved of duties for the evening. Thank you very much, sir. And Sonny clicked his heels and left the room. And my parents heard me gasp and heard me scuttle into the room. And they were downstairs going, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Poor little Edwin. And they didn't want to ruin the illusion of Christmas for me. So as a child, I was told that Santa was having an affair with my mother and uh, I still believed in him so that worked out um, but I was just very wary of him and didn't know didn't know how to respond and to keep up the lie you know my dad moved into an apartment in town and Santa in quotation marks came to live with us which my dad dressed as Santa but when he was in the Santa suit he just took on a whole different persona and uh, was very attractive to my mother. So then my mum started divorce proceedings against my father and was going to marry Santa Claus. And this went on for years. And I'm just, you know, and that's the bit. And there's no real, I think the out was, it only came to, it only it only finished when my mum got one of her friends to dress up as Mrs. Claus Sandra uh, is her first name. Not a lot of people know that. Some people call her Merry Christmas. And I'm like, no. 
if she's married to Santa Claus, then she's taken his name because she'd be, I mean, she'd be old fashioned. And so would he because he's immortal and he's been around for a long time. Um, but my mum got one of her friends to dress up as Sandra Claus, Mrs. Claus, and like drag him out by his ear. He was like, yeah, where the hell have you been? What are you doing with this floozy? Come on, get back to the North Pole. The elves are running around flapping their little arms. Their pointy shoes and hats are everywhere and they're filthy. They don't wash when if you're not around to throw them all in the big hot tub. I don't know what's going on with their relationship. But that was the bit. And that was uh, my relationship with Santa Claus. And then I was talking about, you know, Santa as a concept. Because, of course, everyone knows that Coca-Cola were the company that uh, invented Santa Claus, if you will. At least the modern iteration of the big red man with the big uh, red cheeks uh, in the big red suit. Um, quite a big man. I, you would say obese. You could almost say morbidly obese. Um, and especially the Coca-Cola Santa Claus. I mean, he looks, you know, to some people they might think, oh, he looks very healthy. He's rosy cheeked and whatever. Yeah, in a baby, maybe. When Luke has rosy cheeks, it means, yeah, he's healthy. Or his teeth are going to come in. And that's going to be something. But Santa is just a big fat man. And I had a bit that I do, that I will be doing uh, in upcoming gigs. Probably in the one I'm hosting in Dunleary in the Lighthouse on the 9th of December which is only six euro in and features myself as MC, Hannah Mamelis of Dream Gun and my old review pal co-host, and Jim Elliott, fantastic Jim Elliott headlining. If you've never seen Jim, he is an American comedian who's as sound as he is funny, and he's very, very, very sound. Uh, so that's a quick plug for that. But yeah, Santa is an immortal morbidly obese man which if he was real would be a oh, spoiler alert by the way just in case you don't know that santa's not real if he was real then uh he would be in a hell of a state he'd be just he'd be suffering from all of the uh, medical problems associated with morbid obesity you know he'd have diabetes he'd probably lose some toes He'd be having heart attacks, shortness of breath, chest pains, um, all sorts of uh, of debilitating issues, Uh, thigh chafing. I mean, that'd be awful, awful. But he's immortal, so he can't die. So he's trapped in this body and in this living hell. Merry Christmas, everybody. Um... So no, yeah, no one really thinks of it. But that's the kind of, and while I was researching Santa Claus, because occasionally you'll take a topic, you know, this is how some comedians write. Here's a little insight into writing. I know one of my friends uh, was doing this thing where she was taking a topic. She'd just pick a random topic. Or sometimes she'd ask me or someone else, like, give me a random topic, just something, uh, uh, an object to write about and I'd be like oh it's birds or something I say that as I looked out my window and a bird flew past and just write down birds and everything associated with birds and why are birds silly Uh, and you know try and come up with jokes with things now sometimes that happens in the moment when you're on stage for me anyway it's like you're you have the kernel of something but you don't have the ending of it. Like I had the kernel of a joke that I did um, uh, last night for the second time, and it worked much better because I had an ending. But, um, and I'll tell you about that now in a second, but Santa Claus, when I looked it up, one of the reasons I found, which made me laugh, and it just turned into, not a bit, but it just turned into me talking about doing research doing joke research and why, like I asked the question, why make children believe in Santa Claus? Why perpetuate this lie? Because 
you're going to find out that it's a lie. And every child, you know, is it a case of you want to, you know, toughen up the child for life? And one of the answers was pretty much yes. It was like you want to teach children from a very young age not to believe everything that they're told by adults. So to me, I thought that was hilarious. It was like, so what you're saying, you want to instill a deep sense of paranoia in children. You want to get that paranoid vein, uh, you know, set in from a very young age. Like you want these kids to be like Jim Garrison in JFK going, we're through the looking glass here, people. Red is white and white is red. Ho, ho, no. It just, uh, it was just funny to me. You know, I think in some, in some ways, like what is the purpose of Santa Claus? Because the thing about it is, why even have a Santa Claus? Because you're trying to uh, instill a sense of right and wrong in children. You know, if you're good, you get toys. If you're bad, you get coal. But I, not even anecdotally, either as a child or as a grown-up, have heard of anyone, any child, not getting presents for Christmas. Maybe they can't get some of the things they want if they're looking for, like, dirt bikes or machine guns or whatever. But I've never heard of... It didn't happen to me or my brothers or any of my friends where they woke up and they had like a bag of coal or some sort of, you know, petrified horse shit or um, a bag of rocks or something or a dead fish. You know, something to say, no, you've been very bad. This is what you get. This is what bad boys get and bad girls. Bad, bad boys give them bags of coal. Bad, bad girls, give them bags of coal too. Everyone gets coal, equal opportunities. Santa is nice, he treats everyone the same. Even the bad boys and girls, gives them the same things. Sorry, um, so... <laughs> so, what's the point of Santa Claus if he's not teaching? You know, because you, you learn right and wrong and how to treat people from your peers, from your uh, primary caregivers, be they parents or aunts and uncles or brothers and sisters or whoever raises you or whatever your situation in life is. Not from Santa Claus. It's a kind of a, and it's a kind of a threat that, you know, if you're not good, you won't get presents, but you don't realize until, you know, you get older that, hey, guess what? There is no Santa Claus. Um, it's been me, your dad, or uh, and your mum all along. And you're like, what? I mean, I figured it out for myself. I remember my younger brother figured it out. I think my older brother probably figured it out much sooner than anyone and didn't say anything to, you know, just to milk the presents for a number of years. Clever. But my younger brother, Jonathan... Um, he knew he knew about it, or he suspected it because he was in his friend's house, and some of the toys they got from Santa Claus had price tags on them from a shop in town or something. And he was like, "Why would if Santa has a workshop and makes all these toys, um, why would there be price tags from Smiths down the road?" And I think my dad's answer, or my mum's answer, because mum was much better at uh, the bullshit. Whereas I think my dad was like, "What? I'm g- give me, leave me alone. I'm, I'm working here. Shut up. Ask your mother." Because she, she said, "Oh well, I mean, sometimes the orders are so immense, and there's only so many elves that can make them. So he has to, he has to buy local. He has to shop local. He has to outsource." <laughs> his uh, his toy manufacturing and just, you know, get it straight straight from Nintendo or uh, whomever th- the, the present is from, which I thought was good. I thought that was very quick and that sort of appeased my brother and uh, kept him in the fog of unknowing for another couple of years. 
And with me, I remember, I think it was actually Christmas Eve. And I was walking up the stairs in, in our old house. And thinking about it now and thinking about my older brother Julian and my younger brother Jonathan when we're in that house. And uh, yeah, I think it's like, it's pretty, uh, I haven't been in that house in, in a long time, but we're walking up the stairs and on the landing was this, it was like a rug of Pope John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, the sequel. Like Pope John Paul was pretty good, but Pope John Paul II took everything that worked about Pope John Paul and just made it bigger and better. The hat was taller and pointier. The prayers were more Latin-y. Um, the beatifications were just, you know, high, so much more highly defined. The CGI was much smoother. Uh, they did away with the matte paintings. Still some miniature work, but um, fantastic, John Paul II. Uh, I think they bought it when he we came to Ireland in 1979, and it was this kind of like a, I, I mean I guess you'd call it a tapestry, but that makes it sound like I grew up in the fucking 1600s, a tapestry representing an event that happened. Whereas now you just have memes about everything, memes, 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 looking for a good time, and. <laughs> I was walking up the stairs and mum was there and for some reason I think I said something like or maybe she suspected that I was becoming a non-believer and I said you know yeah I don't know Santa have you ever seen Santa or something like that and mum told me this long elaborate story about when she was a kid and she looked out the window in Forban, where she lived, and her brother John was there, um, our my late uncle, her late brother, and they heard a ho ho ho, a faint ho ho ho, and they heard, they looked out the window and they saw that it kind of went behind a cloud, but they could definitely see the waggling tail of a reindeer. She told me this, and once it got on for like two or three minutes, which is a long time to be telling a story to a child. And I think I don't know how old I was, 10, 11 or something. Who knows? I mean, you don't you, you don't even think about those things when you're you only think about how old you are when you're old. You never think about how old you are when you're young. At least I don't remember ever doing that. The only time I remember is like when I was 10 or when I was 13, because those are the kind of, you know, double digits and then teenage years. And then after that, it's like, whatever. You just want to be old enough to do all do all the adult things like uh, drink and, and vote and have sex. Uh, not at the same time, though. I mean, unless the, the voting booth is very private. But only one person is ever really allowed in there, as is my understanding. Um, I'm not a big voter. I vote in referendums, but I don't vote for politicians because I just don't trust them. And maybe that's me throwing my vote away. But look, that's beside the point. I'd vote for Santa if he was real. But my mum told this elaborate story about Santa flying across the sky and then catching a glimpse of him and hearing his his bellowing, laughing ho-ho-ho off in the distance. And I just went, he's not real, is he? And mum went, no. I went, yeah, thought so. Good night, mum. And that was it. There was no sort of trauma. But here's the thing, folks. When people find out about Santa Claus not being real, it must be like, I don't think any kid is like, uh, what they should be doing is like freaking out because the gravy train is over. The gravy train that is full of presents, not gravy, unless they've asked for gravy and they're getting gravy from a weird kid who wants gravy for Christmas. And they're like, oh, right, I guess that's the end of presents. But no, presents keep coming. So what's the point of even having Santa Claus if you're just going to keep getting presents beyond the point where, you know, you stop believing in him uh, because he's not real? But Ed, you can still believe in Santa even though he's not real. Yeah, I know, but what I'm saying is 
He's not real. That's him texting me now. You have Santa's text number? No, because he's not real. Wait, now I'm confused. Is he real? No, he's not. Speaking of gravy, um, what I love about Christmas, and it's begun, Christmas sandwich season. I've talked about this before on the podcast. Myself and Cara are big fans of Christmas sandwiches. I've already had a sample of two, no, three, rather. I had a Circle K, which is a garage Christmas sandwich. It was a fiver, which I didn't even realize till after the fact. I just went, oh my God, I just paid a fiver for the sandwich. And you know what? It was okay. It had turkey, it had ham, it had stuffing, but it didn't have cranberry sauce. As far as I remember, it didn't really have cranberry sauce. Now, Cara got a Christmas sandwich for me from Marks and Spencer's. That was better. That was better quality. That had uh, more cranberry sauce and it had nice layers. It had nice proportions. That's the most important thing with any sandwich is that the proportions of the sandwich are nicely proportioned. Now, we had a sandwich from, oh, Hush was the name of the place. Hush in Rathmines in Dublin City. Not sponsored by Hush in any way. I saw on someone's Instagram was posting about Christmas sandwiches. They're obviously uh, someone who's as big sandwich fan as uh, myself and Cara. So we went down to Hush and we got some takeaway sandwiches. And these were, unlike the garage and the Marks and Spencer's Christmas sandwich, this was a made-to-order uh, toasted boil. So immediately you're kind of like, well, this is going to be much better. So it had turkey. It had ham. It had stuffing. It had cranberry sauce. But then it also had gravy. Gravy in a sandwich. Now, I don't know if that should be there. To be honest, it was kind of like, there wasn't much gravy. It was like if you got a sort of a thin layer of mayonnaise but the mayonnaise was gravy. That's kind of how it was in the sandwich. But the whole concept of a Christmas sandwich is it's the leftovers, you know, that's kind of where it comes from. It's the leftover turkey, it's the leftover ham, it's the leftover stuffing and cranberry sauce. But one thing that's never left over after a Christmas dinner is gravy. No one's clamoring for a nice hot cup of gravy on Stevens's day. Or Boxing Day, if you're listening to this in the UK. And I was kind of... I didn't know how I felt about the gravy in the sandwich. Now, I ate the whole sandwich, but I think, honestly, it would have been nicer without the gravy. But, hey, look, I was happy to have it. And I will keep you updated on... Where is the best Christmas sandwich over the next uh, coming weeks? And I hope you enjoy me talking about Christmas sandwiches. I'm going to end this episode. uh, Well, look, uh, let's have another little wrap. Yeah, come on now. It's nearly time to go. It's nearly time to go. It's the end of the show. And that's the time that you traditionally go. I hope Christmas is cool for you. I hope it snows. I hope it snows. I hope it snows down on your face. I hope it snows all over the place. I hope you get the sandwich that you deserve. I hope that you get served a lovely Christmas sandwich. I don't hope you get served some bad stuff or ham. Unless you like it, that's good for you, man. So, guys, that is the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you have a spare couple of seconds or minutes, I know you all got busy lives. If you could give me a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be great. Uh, Five stars would be even better. It really helps get this podcast into the ears of people who want to listen to it. Thank you for listening to it very much. If you want to become a patron, you can go to Edwin Salmon of Knowledge on Patreon. And for €5 a month, 
which is cheaper than a pint of Guinness these days. You can get extra episodes. You can get my book. I'll be putting out an extra episode in the next day or so. And I'll be putting out lots of extra content uh, coming up to Christmas and around Christmas. I'm going to be doing some uh, Santa stuff. Uh, I've been talking about them long enough, so I'm going to do some Santa stuff. And uh, the extra episode will be probably going up tomorrow. So if you want to get in on that, you can. If not, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If you want to go back to episode one and just play all the episodes through, uh, just put it on at night and just let it go through and play all 99, sorry, 100 episodes now of this podcast. You are special. Yes, you. I'm talking to you. Uh, Someone's hoovering outside, which I hope you haven't picked up on. But this is the uh, this is what happens when you don't have a soundproof studio. Guys, take care. See you soon. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. See you now later. Good luck now. I'll see you soon. Good luck now. See you now later. There you go now. Look at you go. Have a sandwich. Bye, 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 bye. Yes, yes.